Ave Maria, grazie plena Dominus Tecum, benedictus un vienibus, benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mate Dei, Orgio Nobis Peccatoribus, nunc in generali motis nostre. Amen. In nome di Padre, di Figli e Spiritu Santi. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, Happy Christmas and welcome to this broadcast Mass on the Feast of St. Stephen, the first martyr of the Church. And the first, we might say, non-related uh, to Jesus martyr of the Church. Because, of course, St. John the Baptist was martyred uh, for the truth. The truth, of course, is personified and embodied in Christ when he denounced uh, Herod for his uh, adulterous marriage. Uh, but he, of course, was Jesus' cousin. Uh, St. Stephen, of course, is the first, therefore, non-relation of Jesus, we might say, uh, uh, to be martyred. After him, of course, uh, James, the brother uh, or cousin of Jesus, uh, was martyred. But St. Stephen, one of those first called by the Apostles after Pentecost, uh, one of the in, in, new converts, as it were, uh, to the gospel preaching, who clearly dedicates his life, fully embraces the gospel, its significance and what it means, and certainly has grasped who Jesus Christ was and is. It is said that he was the first among those whom the apostles appointed as deacons in the church of Jerusalem, that early nascent church that was just beginning after Pentecost. And the duty, of course, of the deacons was to assist both in the practical and as well as the pastoral, as well as the liturgical aspects of the sacred ministry, to allow the apostles the time and the freedom to think and to pray and to teach, and of course, eventually to go on their missionary journeys. The deacons had responsibility for looking after the material properties of the church, they had the responsibility for the day-to-day -day administration of uh, the church's affairs. So it was that the deacons, of course, were responsible for the gathering together and the tending of the congregation. Uh, they were responsible for the uh, uh, gathering and dispensing of alms, uh, of money for the poor. Uh, they were responsible for the sharing of gifts and material assets as each uh, had need uh, among the congregation. Uh, and they had the wonderful and auspicious duty, of course, of assisting the Holy Apostles whenever they offered the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the Eucharist, which, though of course, may not have been quite in the same fashion and form that we uh, have it and have received it today, but nonetheless was not too distant from it at all. Prayers of supplication, uh, prayers of entreaty to God of his mercy, uh, prayers of confession, of forgiveness, of deliverance, uh, of glorification of God, uh, of uh, the symbol of faith, the profession of faith, uh, and then of course the offertory and uh, the uh, witnessing, the coming down, the representation of both the miracle of Bethlehem and the incarnation and of the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know all these things were a part of the uh, early liturgy. Uh, that the Apostles celebrated. All of this then Stephen had particular charge of, had uh, been noticed by the Apostles as one particularly suited to this task, as one called even perhaps by God to it, and who was made chief among the deacons. So uh, archdeacon would be uh, the correct phraseology uh, from the first century, uh, from second century onwards, uh, but perhaps not quite just yet in the middle of the first century, in this time of the Apostles. Even so, Stephen was well placed within, in the church and uh, well regarded and obviously beloved by both of the Apostles and the, uh, the people, uh, and had, uh, was given the inspiration, the guidance and the authority to preach and to teach the Gospel. And this is in preaching that eventually, of course, leads to his martyrdom. We are told that uh, in the synagogues he is preaching and the uh, freedmen, the Syrians, the Alexandrians, these uh, intellectual religious types, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes come to hear him preach. 
Indeed, uh, tradition tells us that uh, Stephen may himself have been originally a Pharisee, that he indeed may have been a co-pupil with uh, Saul, who later became Paul, of course, uh, who were students of uh, Gamaliel, the uh, uh, great Pharisaical doctor. And so Stephen, preaching the gospel, uh, is derided uh, by those otherwise uh, intelligent and pious people. But his preaching is so radical to their ears, the truth of the gospel and of Jesus Christ, so radical to their ears that they seek to have him condemned as a heretic and to have him stoned to death. And of course it is his co-pupil Saul who is uh, the person to whom they give their cloaks to, taking them off to ensure that they can make a good aim with their stones. And Stephen at that moment is blessed with a wonderful vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God and he expresses with joy his faith again. And after and while they are stoning him, just before he expires, in the manner of his crucified Lord, he begs forgiveness of God for them. He blesses and prays for those who are persecuting him. What's wonderful, of course, about the Feast of St. Stephen being, as it is on this, the day after uh, the Feast of the Nativity or Christmas Day, is that in Stephen we have this wonderful lesson presented to us by Holy Mother Church, by his testimony and his witness of what it means to be one who follows Christ of what it means to be one who has the Christ child, the embodiment and the personification of the manifestation of God's love, dwelling in one's heart. For surely only true love of God, only having grasped the true nature of the truth about Jesus Christ and of his gospel, his message, could have allowed one to surrender oneself willingly to be stoned to death to be persecuted the gospel today reminds us of our Lord's own admonishment to the disciples and the apostles to expect persecution and we see here how quickly uh, after his death and after Pentecost uh, this begins to become a reality. His prophecy that they too will endure persecution, that they will be turfed out of the synagogues, that they will be turfed out of the temple. And for elsewhere, of course, he said, for as much as they do to the master, will they do to the, uh, to, uh, the servant. And this is an aspect, my brothers and sisters, of our lives as Christians that so many of us shy away from. Many of us shy away from making a stand for our faith, for our belief, for our truth. Indeed, not our truth, but the objective truth about Jesus. We shy away from the prospect of the ignominy and the insults and the degradation and the humiliation that may follow. We keep quiet. We keep our opinions to ourselves. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to provoke. We dislike confrontation. Etc. Etc. There are all sorts of very uh, valid sounding reasons and excuses that we give ourselves or make of ourselves to avoid proclaiming the gospel, to avoid speaking up for our faith, to avoid defending the very name of Jesus Christ but through which we receive our salvation. How many
many of us have the temerity to correct blasphemy when we hear it? How many of us look askance, shot a glance, or ask politely when somebody uses the name of the Lord in vain? I say, excuse me, would you mind not doing that? And those who are fearful and who will shy away from defending the very name of Jesus, that name which is above all names in heaven and earth, that name for which every knee should bow, if one is ashamed or fearful of defending that name, how on earth is one going, how, how on earth can one be prepared to defend or to proclaim his gospel. And so there are some, of course, who have watered down the theology and the, uh, the teaching, the expression and the practice of the uh, Christian faith to one that is more or less social work. To the concept of niceness. And of course the benefit of niceness, the benefit of only being nice, the benefit of uh, uh, only, be, uh, only uh, being seen to be nice, is that it's very rarely challenged. Unless you get somebody who clearly fell out of bed the wrong way, most people can stand niceness. Most people are okay with niceness. Most people like niceness. It's nice to be nice, people say. But nobody gets persecuted for being nice. Nobody is killed, made a martyr for being nice. Being nice is not what the gospel is about. Being nice is not what being a Christian is is about. Because the difference between niceness and sacrifice is that only one truly encapsulates and reflects and manifests and, and expresses God's love. People can be nice and may appear altruistic, but really they're just bathing in that uh, virtuous, uh, self-reflected glory. It's nice to be nice. It's nice for people and others to say that you're nice or to think that you're nice. Whereas sacrifice... Caritas, charity, true love, which is selfless, voluntary, seeks no reward, that is much more challenging. But is also, too, much more rewarding. It is sacrifice, my brothers and sisters, that encapsulates the gospel message of God's love. It is being prepared and willing to sacrifice. Not just in acts of niceness, but being prepared to bear the name of Jesus and to suffer with him the ignominy and the hatred of the world. To be prepared to make a stand for truth. To be prepared to make a stand for God's truth. To be prepared to make a stand for Christ's own teaching about the nature 
of ourselves, of existence, of this life, of its meaning, of its purpose, of the true nature of who we are as creatures of God, who might be children of God. If only we would bend our hearts and our minds, if we would surrender our will to his will, if we would realise in this life the purpose for which we were conceived in his mind and brought into existence and are permitted graciously and mercifully to breathe the air we breathe. Gospel is about sacrifices, about making sacrifices. And just as the Christ child in the manger will be sacrificed upon the cross, the Holy Mother Church brings to us, before our eyes, upholds to us one who was prepared to respond with sacrificial love to the love made manifest in God in Christ, who was prepared to die for the gospel, prepared to die for the faith, prepared to die for the truth. Then, my brothers and sisters, in this Christmas season, it wasn't over this morning from last night, it's still continuing. We have an octave, eight days of Christmas, and then even so, the uh, season extends into Epiphany, and then from Epiphany time up to Candlemas. And all that this season is supposed to embody, not just of niceness, not just of peace and goodwill, not just of being kind to one another or kind to the poor. The essence of this season is about sacrificial love. May we strive every day, my brothers and sisters, as Christians, to manifest God's love. allow the Christ child who dwells in our hearts to love others through us, to help us, make us, coerce us, enable us to love those who we would otherwise find it difficult to love. That in his loving through us they may know his love for them. And we may, may be drawn then to the truth about themselves and who they really are in the eyes of God. And why he loves them so. And what he desires for them, both in this life and in the next. Let us, my brothers and sisters, be prepared to give our lives as Stephen was, and as he did. Let us be prepared amongst our family and friends and our social circles, in every aspect of our lives, to give an account for that faith, that hope which is in us, as St Peter commends us. To share with others that knowledge of the love of God which enables us to endure all things in this life. Both the good and the bad. Both the joy and the suffering. Because we know that this life is not everything there is. But in many ways only a foretaste of what will be. Or what could be. Or what might be. If our witness matched. The promises of Christ. For he commands us to love as he loved. Let 
podcast, my brothers and sisters, make a point this Christmas season of sacrificially loving. Yesterday we had ample opportunity, I hope, to experience and to enjoy the wonderful sharing nature of goodwill and peace and even love that is expressed generally at this time of year. But Christmas was not just yesterday. It is today and should be forever in our lives who confess Jesus Christ as Lord, who live in this world no longer of it, being citizens of heaven through receipt of our salvation by baptism, who have been reborn and made a new creation in him, that we might be lights to the world, radiating his light of love. That those who live in darkness may no longer despair nor feel lonely, may never be desolate or hopeless, but be given encouragement, be touched, and be made known by the love of God, who would use us as instruments for his will and purpose. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.